What if I could share with you five incredible techniques that are gonna allow you to develop any Excel application in no time at all? Hi, this is Randy with Excel for Freelancers, and today we're gonna to do just that when I share with you my five best techniques that have allowed me to develop hundreds of applications over the years, each in just a few days. Today, you're gonna to learn all of that so that you can now 10X your development in Excel. I cannot wait, so let's get started. All right, thank you so much for joining me. I've got a really fantastic training because we're gonna zero in on just those five fundamentals that allow you to develop any type of application you want regardless. And of course, I'm gonna show you exactly how to do that in an incredible application with this drag and drop appointment scheduler. So, and I've got a bonus for you coming up. It's gonna be an incredible training because we're gonna focus on just the most important parts, the foundational parts that will help you. And I really wanna help you develop these applications i bring you these trainings each and every tuesday and very soon on the weekends we're going to be have a basic vba uh, training which is going to be really nice because each and every weekend a lot of you have asked me hey randy your skills are great and your applications are great but how do i learn the basics of vba and so i'm going to be bringing that to you in a much shorter maybe 15 to 30 minutes each week so we'll also have these incredible development applications on tuesdays and on the weekend saturday or sunday we will be sharing with you a video of 15 to 30 minutes on basic vba techniques so that you can excel in vba to application development regardless of what your skills are so i want to bring something for everybody so that's coming up and i'm really excited for that of course if you have not yet become a subscriber now is a great time to do that go ahead and click on the subscription button below don't forget that notification icon bell that'll ensure that you get these trainings each and every week there are great many ways to support this channel of course these trainings are absolutely free but if you do want to support us one great way is through patreon patreon is a great platform because it allows you your feedback to come to me and then me to develop additional features or focus on an area or maybe you want me to fix something each and every week i do that there's lots of other additional resources such as pdf codebooks such as early bird discounts such as uh downloadable recordings and a whole lot more so I'll include the link down below. Patreon is a great way to support this channel. All right, we're gonna get started right away. I've got the five fundamentals and I'm gonna share with you and I'm gonna see how you can incorporate these five fundamentals in every application you can build. You're gonna be able to take these skills and these fundamentals and you're gonna bring them over to any application and it's gonna really help you. You know, what applications that would take me weeks, if not months, I can now do in days because I've learned these fundamentals and because I'm going to share them with you. So advanced filters, right? I use advanced filters in every single training. If you have seen my trainings before, you see we're gonna go over advanced filters. The next is these fundamental formulas. There are really four essential fundamental, of course, there are thousands of formulas, but there are four that, that I've used in almost every training and they're fundamental to application development so these are the ones that i really want to share with you data mapping data mapping is something that i came up with many years ago and it really helps us code quicker and it allows the operations to work quicker and so you can code with just a few lines of code which would be many lines of code and so data mapping we're going to go over that two different options on that shape utilization now shapes are extremely powerful and i've used them in maybe 80 percent of my videos and i'm going to share with you why we can do that and how we can incorporate those in almost any type of application how you can use shapes to present data and shapes are and they're also extremely fast they're actually faster than writing scales and lastly sorting data sorting data is really important to be able to sort your data in in a way that the user can view so those are really the five fundamentals now if you've seen my trainings before this will be somewhat a review but what you're going to learn is how to put all these together into an application now i've got a great application that i'm going to be sharing with you and that is this drag and drop appointment schedule it's a full feature but as, instead of going through every aspect of this i really want to focus on these fundamentals because my goal is to get you to be able to develop these applications yourself and make a whole lot of money whether you're selling them on etsy 
or whether you're doing freelance work or whether you're developing these applications on your own website or however you're doing it or whether you're creating applications for your work or your company i want to be able to make you successful with excel and not just teach you excel so that is my goal here and that's what we're going to go over all right let's go into the five fundamentals and we're going to go directly into that now i've got a really cool uh, a drag and drop scheduler basically you can select on anything you can change the name of the appointment the contact name we can add or edit contact names we can move it over if we want to uh, move it over we can do that so that's a nice little feature here that we have just by dragging it over it's going to move all and the appointment's going to be automatically updated so it's a very cool feature we're not going to go over every single aspect this is a little bit similar to something we created a few weeks ago called the calendar so if it looks a little familiar it is but what i really want to share with you is the fundamentals and we're going to go over that now now the first one that we're going to be going over is advanced filters advanced filters basically allows us to quickly filter data regardless of how much whether even if you have hundreds of thousands of line of data advanced filters allows us to put in any criteria sometimes no criteria into that and so how do we bring that into an application these advanced filters well let's just take this ex example this is a scheduling application now in this particular application we've got a database of data and that's going to be our appointments and what we want to do is we want to bring those appointments into this application this scheduling but obviously we don't want all the data right we don't want every month of every year we only want data within the current month so that's going to be in this case october 2023 so how do we do that so it's going to be filtered right so what we need to do is use that advanced filter techniques to do that now in this scheduler we have the start date which is here which is the sunday right but we want to understand this first of the month so if we move over here we've got a month start date located in b4 and that's a named range called month start so that is our first portion of the filter so that's part of that advanced filter we have our original data which is the appointment item so here's all of our original data so what we want to do is take all that data develop some criteria from that data and then have those results come into a different area using advanced filter we want to copy those results into that different area and then what we want to do is take that data and put it into our application in many number of ways in which we have in this case we're using shapes to represent that data which we'll get into a little bit more so how do we use that advanced filter well within the code basically what you want to do is you first want to determine the last row we need to know the last row is 58. that's the first portion of that within vba determining we need to know is that first row is it uh, like let's say it's the header row once we determine that that means we have no data we can exit out once we determine that we do actually have data we can then determine the criteria now in this case we've determined the criteria here using our date so we have an appointment date here our criteria is here in i2 and j2 and we have our criteria now our criteria is going to be greater than or equal the month start now you just saw that month start located right here on the schedule string b4 is our month start so that's our month so what about our month end what is our month end date right because we want to know all the appointments that started from the month start or equal that and a greater than but less than or equal the end of the date so if we know the month start we can determine and calculate and generate the end of the month using the eo month formula eo month end of month and it's going to be less than or equal right here the month start plus zero months ahead zero months back and so that's going to let us know that's going to be the end date and you're going to see these numbers here now we want those numbers that's very important those numbers represent dates but we really want them in a number format and the reason we want that is because that regardless of your date formats or your regional settings you want to make sure that they are corresponding to that so for example if i do four or five two zero zero here and then i do in this one four five two three zero we want to ensure that those are dates all we need to do is just highlight them go into the home and then go here and then go to the short dates and we can see that it's october 1st to october 31st and that's exactly what we want so we know that that's accurate what we're going to do then is determine so our criteria is going to be i2 through j3 that is our criteria we want the results to come m2 through o once we get all those results that is how we do the advanced filter and then what we can do is we can then loop through these results and then we can bring them into the schedule we'll be going over a little bit of detail that when we work with those shapes so that's exactly how we do it so that's kind of the fundamentals but how do we get that done inside vba 
The best way to do that in VBA is, of course, we're going to go into the Developers tab. If you don't have the Developers tab open or available, you can just go here into Options, and then what you'll do is you'll go into the Custom ribbon, and then you want to select Developer. Make sure that Developer is select. You can also get to it through a shortcut, Alt. F11 will get you there. Once we do that, what we're going to be doing is this is attached to a scheduling macro. It's a scheduling macro and it's called Schedule Refresh. And I'll bring this into the screen here. And this is RVB. So this is the one we want to go over. Now, this is a little bit larger macro, but we're going to focus just on that advanced filter because that is the advanced filter that, that is so powerful that's going to take our data. So again, we're going to focus on the appointments database. The appointments database is right here. This is where we start our advanced filter. And this is, it's very, very simple concept. We determine the last row here. This is called a long variable, last row. It's a long type variable, whole number. We're going to determine that last row, as I mentioned, based on that appointments database. Once we determine that, we need to check, is there any actual data inside the database? And to do that, we can determine it using one statement called, if the last row is less than four, then exit the sub. And basically what that means, if there's no data at all, right, we only have the headers, we can exit the sub. There's no reason to run an advanced filter. In fact, it'll probably produce a bug if we try to run that with only uh, one row or zero rows of data. So we want to make sure that we actually have data. We're going to turn off application screen updating. It's going to go to false. Now, that's really important because we want to make sure that our code runs really fast. Now, what is very important that if we turn it off before we exit the sub, we need to make sure to turn it on. So if there's any reason we're going to exit the sub, like right here, we need to turn it back on. So in case this, if you see something like this, we would need to turn it back on. So we're going to just, before we exit the sub, we're going to go here, paste it in here, and put this to true. And then we're going to use and if. Okay. So before exiting the sub, we need to make sure to turn it on again. Okay. Like that. Okay. So what we're going to do is now we're ready to run that advanced filter. And that's that fundamental. We're going to take that original rows of data, A3 through F. And here's our original data right here, A3 through F. We, we don't necessarily need notes in this case. So we just bring it to duration. Notes are not necessary, but if you did need the notes in the result, you could bring it all the way to G, of course. But we don't necessarily need the notes. We're not going to use them in this part, so we don't need them. The one important thing is when you're doing advanced filters, the thing that ties most of us up and creates issues is because our headers here, either in the criteria or our headers here in the results are different names or they're slightly different. And what happens when you see that? Well, if you see that, right, let's, let's change it just so you can recognize that bug when you see it. And I go to schedule and I try to refresh that. You're gonna get something that looks like this. The extract range has a missing or invalid field name. And when you debug it, it's gonna go right to here. And basically what, when you see this, it means there's some issue with the header rows. So some issue with the header rows. And that means that inside here, our contact names is different than our contact names. They must always be the same. So the best way to do that is just simply to copy and paste, right? When you're not sure, we're just going to copy and paste them all the way over and put them directly into here. So we want to make sure they are the same. So that, that's a common error that we're going to get when we use advanced filters. So as long as and we can run it now, it's going to be fine. And uh, now, so what we want is our criteria range, I2 through J3. We'll bring that down and bring it back up so we can see both. That is our criteria. That's going to be the first of the month all the way until the end of the month. And then lastly, we want the results M2 through Q2, M2 through Q2. That's going to be our end results. And we want the results to come here. That is the advanced filter. The next step inside this macro is to loop through these. Now, we've been over this on the schedules, and I have a schedule dedicated to this, but I really want to focus on that very, very important advanced filter. Once we complete, we're going to determine the last row of the advanced filter. Right? If it's less than three, that means we have no results, and we can exit the sub. Once we determine we have results, we would then go ahead and loop through the data and then bringing that data in. So that's advanced filter. That's a super powerful feature used in almost everything, whether you want those results to come directly in a form. You can then put these results in any order. The order doesn't matter. And also the format doesn't matter because if users are not necessarily going to see this database, the format doesn't matter. You would then bring those results into your own application in any form. Ours are coming in a form of shapes and we can see them here on the schedule. They're in the form of shapes. So you can bring it in any way, but the advanced filters are super, super powerful, right? And uh, you, again, just wanna make sure that those header names are accurate. We wanna make sure that the criteria is set 
also. And so that's it. That's an advanced filter. Now that type of advanced filter has a criteria. There are times when we also want to create advanced filters if we see that uh, for a unique record list. So maybe we only want to create a unique record list. And what do I mean by that? If I take a look in the contacts here, I've got a list of contact names. Now I might have some blank rows if they've been deleted, but I also want them alphabetized, but I don't want to disturb this original database. I want to keep it exactly the same. I want the contact IDs name. I don't want to sort that, but I do want them sorted alphabetically. And I also want to create a named range, which we're going to get into in a little bit. I want to create an advanced filter, but this particular filter doesn't have any criteria. I simply want all of the unique records and I want them located in a different area here. And so we used advanced filters to create unique records. And that's exactly what we did here. And and this is important because when I enter inside our applications, you may want to have a unique sorted list for your names. And that's what you have here. So when I select a contact, we see that it's always going to be sorted. In fact, if I want to add a brand new one and I'm going to call it Fred Frames, Fred, right? And I want to save that. We want to make sure that the next time we enter that it's automatically sorted. As we can see, it's automatically sorted. So, and if we take a look inside our contacts database, we see that we have a new one. So what we want to do with our advanced filter is create a brand new unique list, a sorted list. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. So we're going to get to sorting um, on the last, but as far as the advanced filter, let me share with you how you would create an advanced filter without any criteria at all. And this actually happens as soon as we save a contact. Notice that uh, when I save this contact, when I edited it and I click save, that is the point where it got resorted. So that's the macro that we're going to jump into so that we can see that how that advanced filter happens. And so we're going to take a look in some back inside the developer, inside our Visual Basic, and we're going to go into the contacts module. And we see here that we have contact save and update. Now, this particular one we'll get into in just a minute when we get to our data mapping. But I want to focus on this macro here called contact sort names. So that's exactly what to do. We're going to run an advanced filter and we're going to sort it. So the advanced filter is simple. We're going to go in the contacts database. And what we're going to do is we're going to, again, determine the last row. If there's no data, then we can exit out of the set. That means there's no contacts. So we don't need to run that advanced filter. However, if there is data, what I want to do is run an advanced filter, but this specific advanced filter does not have any criteria. If we see there is a space between here, that means no criteria. Now, keep in mind that if you are running an advanced filter, let's say we had two different uh, advanced filters. We had one here that is running and maybe we have a name search here. If we're running a second advanced filter with criteria on the same sheet, then what you want to do is delete any criteria. It's more of a safety thing, and that's really important. So how would we do that? We may want to, but this particular sheet, there's no other criteria. There's only one. But if there was, meaning let's say we had a searching for names, and on another sheet we wanted to put a search in, and we wanted to know only names that started with B or only last names that started with Fred or whatever, we would do this. We would want to do on air resume next. So we do on air resume next in case there's an on air go to zero. So we're just going to wrap that. And what we want to do is we can use dot names and then criteria. And we want to delete that dot delete. And what that's going to do is delete any criteria that might be on the sheet. And that the reason is because let's say we ran an advanced filter on the same sheet and that had a criteria, even though we've left this blank, it will assume and it will remember that criteria. So whenever we run an advanced filter without any criteria, it's always a good practice to delete the criteria first. And if there is no criteria, it could create an error. Therefore, we've wrapped in an on air resume next and on air go to zero. Okay, so in this case, we're gonna run our advanced filter. We know that we've got data. We're only focused on column B. So only on column B are we focused on here. Let me pull that up for you. So only the contact names. Now we're going to determine the last row. And then what we're going to do is we want to make sure, again, we want to make sure these header names are exactly the same and our results are simply going to go in L2 and we want unique values. So B3 is our, we're running our advanced filter. We're going to copy that filter. We're not going to use any criteria at all. We're going to copy it to the range L2 and we want unique to be true. Now, just briefly in the scheduling, when we looked at the scheduling here, on our advanced filter here, we were also running advanced filter, we we're copying it. However, we had criteria. So here we have criteria 
and inside our contacts, we don't have any criteria. So that means we're going to get unique records. Okay, so that's all we need to do. I'm going to get in the sort in a moment because that's another feature. That's one of the five fundamentals. So and then determining the last row. So that's it. So that's advanced filters, one with criteria and one without. Very, very powerful advanced filters. So that's advanced filters. So that's the first one. The next one is fundamental formulas. Fundamental formulas, like I said, there's thousands of formulas and I've used many, many formulas, but there are really four uh, fundamental formulas that I've used in almost every application. And I wanna share that to you so that you understand and know how to use these formulas and how you can apply them to application development. By learning just these four formulas, it's also gonna help you rapidly develop these applications. The first is match. I use match in every single training just about, and in this one, like no other. Okay, so inside the scheduling screen, match is generally used for when we want to find a record or a row or something specific in a database. For example, if I want to look up, I've got an appointment and I want, I've got an item ID and I wanna determine what row that item ID is on, I would use match for that. Or if I want to find out what particular row a contact name is, and I have a contact ID or a contact name, and I can do that. So for appointment databases, for example, in this case, I've got an appointment ID, and I want to know what row that appointment ID is situated on. I can use match for that. As long as I have the appointment ID, match is going to help us with that. So inside our formulas and name manager, I've got a named range for our appointment ID. So if we look here in appointment ID, all the way at the top here, we see we have actually it's item ID here. So I've got item ID. If I tab over to that, we see that we've got a named range using the offset formula for this, which is the formula we're going to be getting into in a moment. So that is a very, very important uh, named range that we need. And we're going to use that with the match. So once I select on an appointment here, I have a very specific ID. That ID is going to make it directly inside B9. So B9 is going to take that on. But I, what I want to know is I want to know the row that's associated with that. I want to know that item database row. If I know select IDs on seven is on what row of the database. So if I'm looking here and I see seven, I want to know that it's on row nine. Match formula is going to help us do that very, very easily. So here's all we have to do. Inside our cell B10 is where we're going to put that database. And here we can see inside here, so we can see if error, we're going to wrap it on if error because in case it's not found, it could create an error. So we want to use if error. Match, we're going to match whether it's B9, the item ID here, and we're going to add three to that. The reason we're adding three is because our first one starts on row four. If our, our first one starts on row four. So if it's the first one found, we want the row number, so we're going to add four. So match is a very, very powerful formula. And you're going to see I use it a lot. And often we're going to use it to determine or extract the row number. Once I know the row number, and then I can edit and I can update records because I know the database row. And of course, that's going to be within a hidden column. Columns A and B will be hidden. So an end user would never see this. Match a very powerful formula. The next is index match. Now I use the combination of index match, index with match. Index will help us look up a, through a named range and we want to extract specific data once we find that row or once we find that call. Index match is a perfect way. Now if we take a look in the admin screen, I'm going to share with you, let's say I've got a list of holidays and holiday dates. What I want to do is I've got a date. If I find that date on a specific row, I want to extract the holiday name from it index match is a perfect formula to do that index we're going to index our holiday names we're going to look for a specific date once we find the row that it's on we are going to return that and i've got some name ranges that are going to help us with this index match formula so let's take a look at some of the name range that we're using inside formulas name manager and i've got two one is called holiday dates so if we tab over let's bring this a little bit smaller so we can see both holiday dates if we use the tab key into that we're going to see the dancing ants around the dates so we're going to use an offset formula and that is for the dates so what we want to do is once we have a date on a calendar we're going to use match match is going to tell us whether it's found in what row it's been found on or which number it's been found on for example if the first position has been found october 15th and we want to know what row it's on we would just add three because October 15th is located on row four, relatively simple. So, but what I want is I don't want just the row record. I want to know, let's say we know it's in position one. What we want to do is we want to index the holiday names, which is this record right here. So we're going to index the holiday names 
and it's going to return the row which is the october and let me show you exactly how that works now that we see both of those named range we have the holiday dates and we have the holiday names so inside our schedule let's say here on this calendar now this is the date october 31st here's the date if we were to reformat that it's on a custom format if i change that to a short date we're going to see that that date actually is october 31st so what i want to do is i want to run i need a formula that's going to look at this date and it's going to determine has it been found inside our holiday dates if it has been found return the holiday name and that's the formula that we have i'm going to undo that so it goes back got a selection change event there there we go so here it is here's the index match now it's a little bit longer of a formula but in a sense it is the index first of all what we want to do is we want to know is that particular item found is that holiday found so we're going to look at that date we're looking in we're going to use the match here f28 and what i'm looking for i'm looking in the holiday dates and i want an exact match so we're going to run this but what i want to do is i want to find out if there's an error if there's if it's an error why would there be an error there would be an error when there's no date found right there's no holiday found it would, the match would create an error so we want to trap that error and we want to use is error so basically saying is error equals true meaning there's no holiday found if that is true then just show blank which is blank i don't want to show anything if no holiday is found now comes the index match part now we know if you know we're since this is in an if statement we know the next part if it's false meaning the holiday has been found and it ha if it has been found what i want to do is i want to index those holiday names index the holiday names we need to determine the number that is returned since both the holiday names and the holiday dates start on the exact same row a number one will return the holiday date so what we're going to do is we're going to use match we're looking for it this right here will return three so we see the holiday dates october 31st right is three so if we take a look we see that three that just showed up there it's going to return three see here's that three right here why is it returning three if i take a look back inside we escape out of there we look in the admin we see that october 31st is the third spot here so now what i want to do is the index here and return halloween which is the third on the row and using the first column so we go back into this and we're going to say so now we know that this returns three we're indexing the holiday names here and i want to return just one column and what that's going to do is return that holiday date using index match is going to show the name of that holiday and it's going to appear directly on there so very very easily to do that index match a very powerful formula okay next up i want to use max from i use max max function almost in every training because max is very important because if i'm creating a new record and i want a unique id for that record max is a great function to help us to do that so what I, we want to do is we want to make sure that we're using max on a range that contains only numbers so we want to make sure that as long as our range contains only numerical values then what we're going to do is we are going to determine the maximum number for example we have that name range called item id which you saw and that's all the items here on this list so if i want to determine the next available item id i'm going to use the max to do just that in this case the next idea is 60. so what we're going to do is we're going to determine the max which is 59 and we're going to add one and that's going to get us 60. and we can do that so inside our schedule i've done that right here inside b11 is going to do just that we're going to wrap it on if error now there, let's say we clear out all the database it could create an error because there's no data at all so if there's an error we're simply going to default it to one for the first record however if there's not an error we're going to take the maximum of all the ids and we're going to add one max is a very important formula for when we do uh, ids we also do the same thing for context so if i want to know the next contact id i've got a named range for context and we're going to do the same exact formula so here we're using max but this time it's for the contact ids and that way when a user creates a new item a new appointment item or new contact we can easily assign the next available id just like that using the max formula so max a very very powerful formula okay lastly on our formulas is the offset count a now you saw this briefly and i use this constantly in every single training it's always on and we use it constantly for our named ranges so for example let's say we have our contact name name range i've got many of them but contact name i only want to show i don't want to show any blank rows with this i only want to show the data that's available so offset count a is a great one for that so let's go into the formulas 
a name manager and let's take a look at this contact name so let's take a look we're going to bring it up here and we're going to zoom into this we're using offset formula and we're going to use we're going to start it on the header row i almost always started on the header row and that is the reason if the user it deletes rows we want to make sure that they can never delete there's at least one row left within your formula if they delete everything that's in your formula it will create a reference error or an error so we want to make sure that there's one static fixed uh, row and we're going to use the header row to do that but we certainly don't want the data to include that header row name and we don't want to count it so what we do is we're going to we're going to use offset and we're going to use one row down one row down that means the starting position is one row down from b3 and then no columns over so we can leave that blank then what we want to do is we want to count all the data in there using count a and we're going to use we can use any column for this now the column that you want to use for this is the column that will always have data for example if i'm going to create a named range based on names here i'm just going to count the required data so we know that a contact id is required so it is this column that i'm going to be using to actually count the data so notice it's from a3 all the way to a large number so a3 is the very important and again we're using the header row we don't want to count the header row but we want to include the header row and again that is because if the user decides to delete rows we don't want it to create an error so that's very important and then we want to subtract one we always want to subtract one from the count and that is because we're actually including the header rows within the count but we don't want to include it in that and we want to make sure that we're just focused on a single column here so that is called the offset count a and that's going to help us trap data and we want to put it in the named range and as we add data or as we remove data this particular named range will automatically contract or add as we create it so it's a very very powerful formula one of the most powerful formulas offset counting and it's generally used within the named range at least when I'm developing applications so those are the four formulas that will help you develop applications in no time at all match formulas that's going to help you find a record row index match that will allow you to extract some particular data from a record when we uh, know the row and of course max we are going to use when we want to create a brand new id and lastly offset when we want to create a named range that is dynamic so four very powerful formulas okay data mapping super cool data mapping is basically the ability to take either a sheet form and map data or a user form and map data and when i say map data what i mean by that is i want to take information from the database let's say we have a schedule i want to take information from the database and i want to be able to either save it into the database or I want to take information from the database and I want to be able to load it into the fields now we've got several fields here I've got let's say six different fields here now I don't want to write six lines of code inside VBA right and what if you have 10 or 15 so the idea is to map the database now there are several ways to do that one of the easiest ways to do that is to uh, put them in rows like this so if we take a look and notice I've got all of my data in order appointment name contact name date time and duration very very simply this is the simplest way to map data inside our database where that information is either saved or it's loaded from our sheet form we have it in the same exact order we have appointment name contact name date time duration and notes it is exactly the same order as we have on our schedule name contact name date time duration and notes so if we've got it in the same order we're not skipping any cells it's very easy to map all we need to do is really determine the rows and the columns and here's what i mean by that we notice that this is on row four this is on row five and this is on row six and seven if we look into our database now that we know they're in, this is on column two three four five right so what we can do is we can use that assimilation between columns and rows to easily either send information into the database or from our database into the form very very easily using a simple loop in fact there's only three lines of code regardless of how much data you have it's just three lines of code and that's why data mapping is so fast so powerful to not only to use but to code and to do that so that's exactly what we're going to do and let me show you some examples of data mapping next up we're going to show you how to map user forms so this example is going to be for sheet forms and that is because we have our form right here on the sheet so it is a sheet form so all we need to do is create a loop let's say we're going to save the data we want to take this data and we want to save it into the database we're going to run a loop from to 
because we're starting our, our appointment ID is already there from two all the way to the last column. How do we know what the last column is? Well, the column after is that's a date format, so we don't want that. That's going to be column eight, so we don't want it. So we're going to go all the way to column seven, right? So we're going to go from two to seven. If I know that I want to run a loop from two to seven and I want to save data, how do I do that through data mapping? If I look on the schedule, I see that this is row four to nine. So if I'm going to go, all I need to do is simply add two to get to that. So let me show you exactly how that's done within the code for saving and for loading. So we're going to go back into the developers. And this time we're going to focus on the scheduling macros. And actually we'll go to the appointment macros here. And we're going to go to this save and update. Now, once you have ensured that the fields have been filled out correctly, we want to make sure that if it's a new or an existing appointment, we're going to determine the row. But here's the point I want to focus on. Here's the data mapping. Again, I mentioned three lines of code. Regardless, we are going to run a long variable appointment column here's the column from two to seven remember those columns that i mentioned to you now all we need to do is map it so we want to save information into our database our appointments database and it's going to come from our sheet i've already called out the scheduling sheet that's the scheduling sheet so that's the sheet that we're on we want to take information from the schedule and put it directly into the database with just three lines of code so we know that the information is coming we're saving it from our schedule and it's coming from column m we know column m is consistent the only thing that's going to change is the row the row is going to be four five all the way through nine and we also know here inside, we know the row. The row is going to be a new row or an existing row, but we know the row. The ID will already be there. So what we're going to do is we're simply going to map the data from two to seven here on the same row. So we can use data mapping for that. And here's what for the appointments call equals two to seven. Now we know our appointment, this is going to be two, right? Our first one's going to start at two. If we add two, what's that going to get us? It's going to get us four. So that means our first value, M4, is going to go into whatever row and column two. And that basically means here, M4 is going to be saved in whatever row inside column two. Next up, I want to save whatever the contact name is, and that's going to go into column three. And where's it coming from? It's coming directly from M5. And that's exactly how we're going to do it here. So that would be as it loops through, the next one's going to be three. So appointment column three is our column inside our database where it's going to get saved. And it's going to come directly from three plus two is five. It's going to come from M5. So this is a loop on how we can save information. But what happens when I select an appointment and I want to load that information in directly from the appointment? Well, what's going to happen then is we're going to determine the database. We're going to determine that row number. Remember, we know the row. That row is going to come directly from here, located that database row is going to come here. So if I know the row, I want to load that information in. We're going to run another loop, this time also from two to seven. But this time, as long as we know the row, I'm going to take the information in column two, take the information in column three, four, five, six, and seven, and I'm going to bring it directly inside here into column M and row four, five. So it's basically the exact opposite of our data mapping. And so that is going to be appointment load. So if we look at the appointment, it's a very simple macro. We're going to determine the row in appointment in B10. Then again, another data mapping here, loop from two to seven based on the number of columns. And then here it's completely the opposite. We're taking it from our database in the associated row. The column is going to go from two to seven and we're going to bring it into our column M. Again, our first one, which is two, is going to go in M4. Our second one is going to go in M5 and so on and so forth. So that's data mapping in reverse when we're going to load it. Okay, great. So that type of data mapping is a very, very quick way to, one, save information from our sheet form into our database, and two, from our database when we're loading it, into our sheet form very very quickly and regardless and that's a great way to do that because as long as you make sure when you're designing it you want to make sure that everything is nice and tight and is always in the same order we want to make sure that our database and our user form are in the same order now that's for sheet but what if we're using a user form let's take a look inside the context 
What if I want to map data and I've got a bunch of contact information? And again, we can do the same type of data mapping using a user form. So that's the second type of data mapping that I wanted to go over with you. Again, we're going to make sure that when we create our user forms and we align our database, we want everything in the same order. Contact name, address, city, state, zip, phone, and email. We take a look inside our contacts database, we have exactly the same order. Contact name, address, city, state, zip, phone, and email. So everything's in that same order. So once we know the order's the same, we can then quickly either, again, save our contact information into the database, or when I'm editing a user form and I want to edit this, let's say Mary Badger, or, uh, and I want to edit her, I can simply click on her and it's going to load the information from the contact database into the user form using data mapping. So here we're using data mapping for a sheet form. So how do we do that? Well, the first point is inside our user form. So we're going to pull up that user form called the contact form. And the important thing is inside the field name. So I'm going to click on the properties here and then bring this over here. And what we're going to do with this, let's line that up so we don't want it sticky there. I want to bring it over a little bit. There we go. So what I want to do here in this case is I want to make sure that our names for our field, our text boxes or drop down boxes or whatever it is, our combo boxes, I want to make sure that they're all aligned properly in the name. So this we're calling field one, this we're calling field two. Now, normally when you're designing user forms, you really want to have a name that is relative to the type of field is. For example, you might call this contact name, or you might call this address, but we are specifically going to give it very general names the only thing difference is the number. Very, very important. And that way we can use data map and do that. So this is called field three, field four, field five, field six. Now, normally you would name things easier to recognize, but because we're using data mapping, everything is the same. So again, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Okay, so those are the names. Because they're named in uniform like that with only the number being the difference, it is going to be very easy, again, with just three lines of code, no matter how many fields we have in our user form inside VBA to either save the user form information into the database or load it from the database into the user form. Three lines of code, very, very similar. So let's take a look at that. When I click save, right, macro is going to run called contact save update. Now that, if we look, go into context, we're going to take a look inside that contact save update, and it's going to be right here. Okay, so first we're going to make sure that, that there's a contact name, right? If that's empty, we can get out. I'm going to determine if it's a new contact or an existing contact, and that's very important because for new contacts, I want to determine the first available contact row, first available inside the contact sheet, and I want to add the contact ID, that contact ID, remember B14 is that next available contact ID. We saw that right here recently using the max formula. So that's gonna get us our next contact ID from B14. And then also what I wanna do is I wanna put in the row. So that means it's only new records are gonna take the contact ID and the row it's gonna be helpful. So we have that two information, but everything else is the same, regardless if it is new or an existing, it's going to save. So back inside the code. So that's all we're doing with the new context. A is gonna take on the contact ID. I is gonna take on the row only for new contacts. If it's an existing contract, all we're gonna do is extract the row from B13. Remember, we use the match formula to do that. Inside there are contacts, which we showed you. Contacts here, that match formula here is gonna determine the contact database row based on the contact name. So we're matching the contact name and we're gonna determine the database row that it's on. Very, very handy. Once we have that row, whether it is a new contact or an existing, we have the contact row. Once we have that contact row, we can use data mapping. This one, excuse me, four lines of code on this one, four lines, regardless of how many fields, we are going to run a loop from two to eight. Why two to eight? We are going to, of course, skip the ID and we have eight fields. We're gonna go contact name address. So all from two to column eight, skipping the row that was already in, that's not gonna change. And the contact ID, these two items will never update once it's been created. So we only need to save or update from columns two to eight. That's why we're using. So what we want to do is the first thing I wanna do is I wanna set the field. If we remember correctly, we named our fields, field one, field two, field three, all the way to field seven. So what we want to do is we want to set those so that we can use the control. So we're going to set the contact field equal to the controls field and the contact column minus one. Why is the contact column minus one? Why do we have this? Remember field one. Field one is what? Contact name. What column is contact name in? Contact name is in column two. 
So if I know the contact name is in column two, now of course I could probably name them, start them out at two. So in other words, what I could do inside this, I could probably make these exactly the same instead of just starting it out at field two and along with the column. So that might be helpful. So that way the field number would automatically align with the column. That can be done as well. So that might be helpful. So if I know that our field number one is in contact column two, all I need to do is to make sure that the contact column, which is two minus one, that's our field one. So once I've set that, what I need to do is I need to take whatever value is in that contact field and place it directly inside the database, inside the contact row and inside the contact column. This simple loop is going to basically save all the data from your user form into your database very, very quickly. So that's for saving. What about if we're loading it up? Loading it up relatively easy. Let's scroll up here and contact load. Oh, here what we want to. Contact load, edit, edit is good. Sorry, I thought it was contact load, same thing. When we're editing a contact, we're taking the existing contact information from the database and we're bringing it into the user form. And we're using contact edit to do that. This is the macro that is tied to this button right here. When I edit a contact, is this macro right here. The first thing it's gonna do, it's gonna make sure that we have a database row that's located inside B14. When I select on that, it's gonna pull that user form up and it's gonna pre-fill all the information from the database into that user form. And so to do that, we just need to run, again, a very, very similar loop. We're gonna determine the contact row, making sure if there's a value that's empty, that means we have no contact. As long as we do have a value in B13, we're gonna put that into the row called contact row. Focusing on the contact form, again, running that loop from two to eight. We're gonna set the contact field exactly like we did for the save macro, no difference. But this time, the only difference is we're taking the information from the database and we're putting it directly into that field inside that user form. The last thing we need to do is simply show the user form. Very, very simple. So those are two powerful ways of how we can show and save and add information into a sheet form from a database, whether we're saving it or loading it, or how we can save and update information from a user form into a database or from a database into a user form using data mapping, whether it's three or four lines of code. Very, very simple. Data mapping, one of the most powerful things that I've ever developed. And I'm really happy to share that with you. And if it's something that you can grasp and you can use it uh, in almost every application. So that's a really powerful type of uh, workaround that we can use for coding that brings the database into our forms. All right, next up on the list, and one of my favorite is shape utilization, right? This is lightning fast data visualization. Shapes are a terrific way to represent data. One, they can hold a lot of data, believe it or not. They're extremely fast. They're versatile. They can be moved around. They can be beautiful. They can show your data in many, many ways. And of course, they can be colored. So we can draw them, we can position them, we can clear them quickly using VBA. Again, they can hold data. In, a cell can hold one form of data. A shape can hold two forms of data. And I'll share that with you. And we can easily modify it through drag and drop. So we're going to be going over all that. And this particular schedule is a great way to show how shapes can represent the data. In this particular application, these appointments are represented by shapes. As we can see, we can drag and drop them. They're showing the appointment time. They show our information for the appointment. They're very dynamic. We can change the color of them if we want to. We can set, we can change the color if we want to make our appointments orange. We can simply do that. I don't know why we'd want to do that and refresh it and boom, just like that, they all get colored in orange. And you notice how fast that is, right? So they can represent and we can use uh, them in ways such as if we want to color them based on type. So they're extremely dynamic, extremely fast. And one of my favorite ways to represent data and hundreds of my applications contain shapes. And we can see how fast if we navigate per month, we can see how fast that they are actually drawn. So shapes are a great way. So how do we do that? How do we take shapes and how do we represent them data? And we take the data and put it into shapes. Well, again, it's great. Now, remember, we had an advanced filter, the first one we did, where we took the month's data and we were able to bring it in and get those results. So now what we want to do is we want to take those results and put them into shapes. 
And so the best way to do that quickly is to start out with a pre-formatted sample shape. So you always want to start with a shape that's pre-formatted exactly the way you want it. Then you may change the color through VBA, but as far as the text is concerned and the style, the shadowing and things like that, and that's exactly what I've done. So if we take a look somewhere around here, let's zoom out, I got it somewhere. There it is right here. So here's our sample shape. I've just put it off the screen. So we give this a very specific name and we're gonna call it here sample appointment shape. So this particular is our sample. So the color doesn't necessarily matter because we changed the color through VBA. And I've put some sample data in just to see how it would look and we can get the font size right so we don't necessarily need to change that through VBA. And so it is this shape that does not get deleted. And so the idea is to duplicate this shape based on the data. But before we want to do that, what we want to do with our shapes is delete all the existing ones. Now, one of the reasons why I love working with shapes so much is because how fast Excel and VBA handle shapes, whether it's deleting them all on a sheet, whether even if it's hundreds of shapes, it can delete it in a split second and adding new ones and formatting and positioning them. It happens within just a second, as you see in this schedule here. So that's what we do. So when we're dealing with shapes, especially on a scheduler like this or something like that, we usually want to delete all the existing data. Now, the important thing to remember is that we want to make sure that the shapes that we're deleting are only the shapes that we want deleted. So what we can do is to make sure that you're naming those shapes very specifically. In other words, we've got shapes here on buttons here, and I've got a shape here. This is a shape, so I've got a lot of shapes on the sheet, but I wanna make sure that I don't delete these shapes. I only want to delete those with appointments. So the idea is this, through VBA, we create a list, we clear out all the existing shapes, and then we format those shapes based on our data and our requirements. We position those shapes based on our data. So all that can happen. And we name those shapes based on our data. If we take a look at this, we see that this is a name called CAL Appointment 41. This one is called CAL Appointment 22. Now the number at the end represents the ID of that appointment. So it's a great way. So again, it's holding that data. So the name of the shape holds the data. The text inside can also hold the data. So here we have two forms of data, one the name of the shape, one the text inside the shape. So shapes are extremely versatile when working with data. And um, even if you're using something simple, if you learn to use shapes, your applications can be far more powerful, far more faster, and you can actually develop them quite rapidly than as opposed to writing to cells. And because you can actually do things like drag and drop, which we're going to get into very, very simply using some simple techniques that I'm going to share with you today. So here's what we're going to do. The first thing what you want to do inside to make sure that the names that you assign those shapes are unique. If I were to name this with something similar, it could get deleted. So we want to make sure that those shapes that you're going to be refreshing have a very unique name that no other shape on your sheet exists. So that's really critical and very important. Once you have that, we want to make sure that we clear everything out. And of course, we run our advanced filter so that we have our new data, which is this, that is going to populate our shapes. So let's get into the VBA and see exactly how we create and use the data in shapes and how it becomes so versatile and how we can use it. So we're gonna get into the VBA and that's for the scheduler. And regardless of the type of application, once you understand how to work with shapes, how to position shapes, color, format, right? You can do almost anything in any type. We've had, again, charts. We've had so many kinds of, of types of charts and schedulers and uh, calendars that we view shapes in on almost everything imaginable with that. So it's a great, great way to do that once we understand the fundamentals of working with shapes. And that's really what I want to share with you. It's just those fundamental principles that you can take with you and then you can use to build out your own applications. So inside the schedule, we did cover a little bit. We covered that advanced filter. That's going to, that brings the data in, but now we want to work with that data. We want to take that data. We want to convert it into a very visual, appealing, fast shape that users can see. And that's what we're going to do. So the first thing we're going to get into the sorts a little bit later. So I'm going to go over that. Not right now because sorting is our last one. So for the results equal three to the last results row. So we want to loop through the data to determine the last results row. Those are our results based on column M. And so that means first thing we need to do 
based on that required field, which is our appointment ID, determine the last row. In this case, it's 51, so that I know where I'm going to loop. I'm going to loop from three all the way through 51. So we're going to loop through our data right here. So this will be 51. The first thing what we want to do is all the information that we want, we're going to put it into variables. I want that appointment ID. It's going to come from column M. I'm going to drop this down so you can see it. I want to know the contact name from column M in a string variable. I want the appointment date, which is a date variable, and I'm going to put that inside appointment date. I believe it is. Sometimes I use the appointment dates as string. Let's see which one I used. Um, so we can see all the appointment information here. So the appointment date as date, the appointment time as a string. Okay, the appointment time was a string. Okay, and the appointment time here. Now, the reason it's a string is because I'm gonna format it. I want that time very, very specific because it is the information that I want. I want that appointment time. So here's the format that I'm assigning that appointment time. This will go into our shape. Inside our schedule, we see that we have our appointment time, which is here. 2 p.m. So we have a very specifically formatted, then we have a colon, then we have the contact name. So the information that's going to go into the shape is the appointment time and the contact name. However, the shape name is going to take on always, it's always going to start out with calendar appointment, APPT, and then the ID. So the name is also going to hold that data of that shape. So understanding that we need to capture all of that data and put it into the variables that we're going to work with. Then what we're going to do is we're going to determine how many appointments we need to know this. I don't need to get into a lot of detail of this. I need to determine how many appointments in a single day. For those of you who have uh, work with me for a long time, you understand that uh, we now can do, actually we can do 10 appointments in a day by making the math. I'm not going to go into this in detail because it's a, it gets a little bit complicated, but basically if we have more than one, we can then make the width of the shape in half and use more. So it's very, very versatile. So we can change the shape size based on the data. So if we have more than five appointments in a daytime, we can shrink them in half and show them. But it does show you how versatile you can make them. So basically, if the number of appointments we're going to count here, I'm counting all of the appointment dates, I want to know the number of appointments in a single day. Because if there's more than five appointments in a single day, I need to know to make them to set the width to half. So basically, that's all we're doing. When it comes to the shapes, I'm going to skip it around. I really want to focus and stay on those shapes. We are going to then duplicate. Remember, we have that sample shape. So the first thing what we want to do is we want to duplicate that shape. Whatever your data is, taking your sample shape and duplicating it and then immediately renaming it, renaming it very specifically, Cal appointment and appointment ID. Very important. Now, remember I said the first thing we want to do is clear all the data. So now that we understand how we're giving them very specific names, before the macro starts, we can then clear all the data, but only data that contain the calendar appointment. And that's exactly what we did at the beginning of this macro. I wanted to show you how we named it first. So all we need to do is loop through all the shapes in this sheet and delete them, but only delete them if they contain the text C-A-L-A-P-P-T. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So we're going to loop for each appointment shape inside the schedule shapes, meaning for every single shape inside that specific sheet, we are going to look if the shape name contains CAL appointment. If it contains it, then delete it. Otherwise, don't do anything else. So you see how we name it, but before we then can clear it all out. So that's all we need to do to clear them out. So going back to where we were, we are going to then duplicate that shape, giving it that unique name, and then we can work with it. So what we're going to do basically is, which I've gone over in other trainings, I'm going to loop through all of these dates in the calendar, running a loop from the columns and the rows, and I'm going to look for the date. And we know the dates here. If the date is found, I know what column and I know what row to place it in. If the date is found, we are going to replace it. The first appointment in the day gets placed right here. The second one, one below, one below, so that if there's more than one, they get placed below each other. And so all we need to do is keep track of how which item we're on. So for example, the first appointment in the day gets placed at the top. The second appointment, one below and one below. So we need to keep track of the number of appointments in a single day. So we can keep track of that. As long as we're keeping track, we know where to place that left position. So what we're going to do is we're going to loop through all the columns and loop through all the rows inside that. So here we're using two loops running through all the rows 
and run through all the calendar columns. Now I have a specific training called Calendar uh, from Scratch and where we actually create this. So if you want a little more detail, but I wanna show you how powerful those shapes are. Once we find the day, we know it's the day, we're going to place that shape in the day. We know it's found that specific row and a specific column. Once we know that, we can set the date. So we're gonna set the left position based on that row, based on that column, based on the left position. And I also wanna set it based on the appointment left. Now this appointment uh, left is going to be either zero or a little bit more. So basically, meaning the left position would be here, or if it's more than five appointments in a day, that left position would get moved over basically. So that's what that job of that appointment left does. Normally it's zero, nothing, but sometimes it can be more if there's more. So we're also going to keep track of the appointment number. We're simply going to increment each appointment in a day. We're gonna grow it by one and then it's gonna go back to zero. So that means if we have three appointments in a single day, we're gonna start out at one, then go to two, then go to three, right? So the idea is this when we place that shape when we place that shape one goes here two goes here and three would be placed below that if there is a third appointment and so that's why it's very important to have the appointment number okay and the top position so we're going to place it on that row so we're placing the shape basically on the calendar in the right spot in the left and so it's based on that date very very powerful once we understand that how to place your date so your data might be very very different so we don't want to go into that but we need to understand that like let's say we're doing a schedule where we have a list of employees and you know assign it you would find the employee row where you want to place it and maybe you have a list of dates or tasks or something here sometimes you use different ways to find the right row and to find the right column once you have that right column you want to place your shape right there and that can be done for any type of training or any type of template that we have whether we are doing employee scheduling or whether you're doing task management or project management there's so many ways that we've used shape so you can see many of my examples of course in there okay next up we also want to set the height the height we're going to make it exactly the same as the row that's located on so we want to match this row height and to do that we're simply going to make the height of it exactly the height of the, wherever it's found so we're just matching the row height the width is simply the schedule the row plus the appointment number right we're adding to the row if we're appointment number two it gets added one more appointment number three and the column the width we're going to multiply times the appointment width. remember the appointment width is one half if it's more than five or it's the full so here we're taking entire width and we're multiplying it if it's more than five i need that width cut in half notice the width of this is cut in half so basically we're shrinking them in half if we have more than five appointments in a single day that's how we fit them okay we're setting the text now the text frame what goes inside the shape Whatever you decide, whatever your data is, you can go in, put inside the text. I mean, the data could be anything we want. We've decided to put the time and the contact name. You could put in the appointment name or whatever you want. So we've decided to put in that time inside that. So we can do that right here. So the text, text frame to text. This is the text that goes into the shape. Remember, we've already added the name of the shape here, but this is the text that goes inside. It's gonna be the appointment time and a colon and the contact name that's the text inside the shape we then want to set a specific color remember you can set dynamic colors what i want to do is i want to take whatever colors in this cell f7 i want to take that color and i want to make the shape the same color whatever the background color is not but even if i change it to this purple here whatever color it is it's automatically going to take that schedule and color it automatically here to that purple or whatever it is so we see it's purple probably not a color but so that's kind of a nice feature so how do we do that how do we so we can use this pop-up color picker or it doesn't matter if we don't use the color picker or whatever we want we can do that too just like that so how do we do that and this is the selected color we also when we make a selection we can also change it so that we can give it a selected color so very very powerful if you want to know which one's selected so let's refresh it go back to that green it's as shiny as my head so let's move it down there we go okay now what we've done is we've selected so now you see how the selected color is red very very powerful when we select the shape we can also change the color 
Another very, very powerful tool. Let's put it back to something a little bit more reasonable. And so we can select here. We can use this color here. Okay, so now when we've selected, so now it refreshed and we've got our color here. So how do we make that happen? Let's go back into the VBA and we understand that we're going to change the fill for color, the RGB of that shape. We're focused on that shape. And we want to put it in the appointment color. Well, where did this variable come from, right? We don't need to keep reassigning it. So what we did is we took that color from the admin all the way up here. So if we take a look inside the appointment color here, let's pull it up right here. Appointment color is equal to the admin F7, the interior color of that cell. So F7, whatever the interior color is, we're going to take that color, it's going to be a string, and I'm going to put it in this variable here. We can then color it based on this. Now we could easily just write that in. We could easily put into your color of F7, we could put that here, but we chose to put it in a variable, which is fine. Okay, then what we want to do is we also want to assign a macro. So not only can shapes hold data, you can create actions based on when you select them. We want something to happen when we make a selection. So with that, in this case, we're assigning a macro to that. Another very, I really don't like that selected color, a, a really very powerful thing. So when we select it, I want something to happen. I want this here to automatically select it. So how do we do that? Let's put that back down to 100% so it stops flashing. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. So as we can see, we've drawing, positioning, and coloring, and clearing shapes. They hold data, and we can modify data through drag and drop. That's the next one we're going to go over in just a moment. Once I change this to a color that doesn't make me nauseous, let's go with orange, that orange. Okay, so here we have, so now when I select something, you see how dynamic it is. When we make that selection change, we can also change the color, but we can want to assign a macro to that. So when we want to assign a macro to a shape, we're going to use on action. And we can assign a macro called schedule appointment select. So that's it for as far as the shape. I'll, I'll skip around and go directly to appointment select. This is the macro that happens when we make a selection. So the first thing what we want to do is we need to know what appointment ID was selected. This is why it's so important to have a numerical name. If I want to know the ID of this appointment, how do I know that? Well, there's a few ways. What I can do is I can simply remove the text CAL appointment, or I can remove the first seven characters, and it's going to be left with the ID. So that's exactly what we do. I want to extract that. And another powerful tool is to use the application caller. Very, very important. The application caller of a shape is the name of the shape that called it. If you try to run this macro from the editor, it's going to possibly create an error. So did this time because there's no actually we're running something now. There we go. So when we run something, we keep in mind that you could create an error. Often we do when we have application caller. It could create an error because there's no shape that called it. So keep that in mind that when you have application caller inside your VBA, you want to make sure that it is a shape that calls that macro. So when we call that macro, we want something to happen. We want to change the color. We want to whatever details are inside. We want those details to come inside here just like that. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing we want to do is we extract that appointment ID into a variable. This time I'm going to take the first seven characters and I'm going to remove them using the replace. So the application caller is the name. I'm going to take the first seven characters using the left and I'm going to replace it with nothing. What that's going to do is going to extract that application ID. Then what I'm going to do, I want to reset all the colors back to the default color. Every color in there, I want to set back to the default color. Where's that default color? It's coming directly from F7 into your color. Here, in this case, we didn't assign it to a variable. We just put it in. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to check every single shape in the sheet. If it contains this calendar appointment, then what we're going to do is we're going to update that color to that. Even if I make a selection again, it's going to color that. But it's going to happen so fast you won't see it. So this one gets colored back to green. But then the next step is to color it that orange. And what is the color? We're going to extract the interior color of F9, which is our selected, and we're going to color that shape. So we can do that here. So 
calendar shapes, we know the appointment ID. We just selected it. So since we've colored every single shape, including the select one, back to our original default color, what we now need to do is actually recolor that selected shape, which is our selected color. So we can do it through this way. We know the appointment ID. We know that it started a calendar appointment. So I can call out that specific shape because I already know what information because I've extracted the ID. We could also put the name into a variable. That would work as well. But I want that ID and I want to extract it. So we're going to take that. We're going to use fill, fill for color RGB. Again, we're going to use F9, which is our selected, selected appointment color. We're going to take that. We're going to place it directly. So it's going to color that selected shape. Now what we want to do is we can also use drag and drop, right? So now it's going to, and I'm going to continue with that macro. So when we want to use drag and drop, it's a really, really cool feature. So we went over drawing and positioning, coloring. We went over holding the data. We see how the text inside and the name of that can both hold data. Now what I want to do is I want to modify that data through drag and drop, and meaning that we can actually change the date of this appointment from the third to the second simply by moving it and dragging and dropping it over. So that's how we're gonna do it. So now if I select it, we see that the date is on the second. If I move it back, selecting it, and move it back, it's gonna move it back. So we're actually modifying the data through dragging and dropping a shape. A very, very cool, so we see now that it's on the third. So how do we make that happen? Well, when we're dragging and dropping, the most important thing is when I make a selection, I need to know what position it's in. So really, I need to know the top position and I need to know the left position. And then what I need to do is I need to basically run a loop, a continuous loop that's going to keep checking to see if that position has changed. Has that left position changed? Has that top position changed? If it has been changed, is it been moved to the right area? Has it been moved to the wrong area? If it's been moved to the right area, maybe we should check to see what data has changed, in this case, dates, and then make the change in the database. So that's exactly what we're going to do. So the first thing you always want when you want to institute that drag and drop is you want to make sure that you've set that position and put that position, that left position, that top position inside a cell somewhere. So we've done that exactly right here inside B15 and B16. So if we take a look and we make a selection, we see that both of those values change. B15 and B16. So we see that the left position didn't change, right? Because we're, we've got the same left, but the top position did. If I select this one, both the left position and the top position change. So the first thing what I want to do on selection is take that information, which is the top position, the left position, and put it into a cell somewhere. So exactly what we're going to do. So inside that macro, as we continue, that appointment ID is going to go into B9. That's important because I want to know that selection. It's going to go right here. Of course, that's going to generate that database row, which is located in B10. And then the next step in B15 and B16, we want to place that information. So B15 is going to take on that left position of the shape that we called, which is application caller. So the left position of that shape is going to put inside B15. Go to B16 is going to take on that top position. So once we have that, now we know its current location. We just need to determine whether it's been moved or not. Also, one thing is we need to understand once it's been moved, right, we need to set things in motion. So I need to determine has it been moved or has it not been moved, right? So we can use that with a true or false, a Boolean setting. We're going to set that inside B1. So B1 is going to stay true. Once we select it, it's going to go to false. If we moved it, it's going to go to true. So as long as it's false, it's going to keep running its loop. If I decide to move it, it's going to go to true, and then it's going to know it's been moved. So what we want to do is first make sure we set it to false. Set the move to false. So anytime you're doing drag and drop, those three components, set the left position, set the top position, and set the move to false, okay? All right, so, and also generally select the shape. The reason we want to select the shape is because we want to give the user the ability. So notice it's selected, right? So that kind of gives the user the ability to quickly move it somewhere else. So it's very, very easy. So all we need to do is just basically, we could use uh, the application caller to, or the calendar appointment select. So we're simply reselecting that shape. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna run a macro to call check for move. So it's generally when you do drag and drop, it's two parts, two different macros, one that actually selects the shape and one that runs a loop that's gonna continually check for the move. And so that's the next macro called check for move. Let's drop down here. 
which is right here called check for move. So this is the macro that's going to continuously check for a duration of time and then it's going to stop. And usually it's a, I think it's about 10 seconds or 15 seconds or something like that. But it depends on this number. So we're going to run that loop. And what we want to do is we want to take that appointment ID. We want to put that into a variable. That's going to be kind of important so that we know exactly which appointment we are going to be moving. So the first thing what we want to do is run our count, run our loop. That's going to give the user the ability to wait, to waiting for them to move it. And the next very, very important thing is do events. We need to add in this line do events. And that's very important important because it's going to allow the user to do any other things like selecting cells and moving around while the timer is going on. So right now it's going and how do I know it's going because I see this is blank. You see this blank as soon as this becomes shows the cell address that means it's stopped running. So notice this here if I select it it shows it but it's really not there right. So if I escape out of there but as soon as it becomes E5 that loop has stopped and it takes a number of seconds, maybe 15, 20, 30 seconds or whatever it is. So the idea is that we want to make sure that we've given the user enough time to make that drag and drop, however long. So it's going to be based on that number to do it. While I'm talking, it is still running this loop. And so if we continue down inside the macro, it's still running right now, but it's okay. You can do other things. So notice, notice E5 now shows up. Okay. So we see that the loop has stopped. So do events will allow the user to do other things. Also, we want to make sure that as soon as B1 goes to true, we exit out of the loop. We absolutely have to find a way. When we do loops like count delays or long loops like that, we need to make sure there's a way to get out of it. And so as soon as B1 becomes true, it's going to escape out of there. So if B1 equals true, then end. We're just exiting all the loop and going out as soon as that happens. Okay, so the first thing what we want to do is I want to check for a move. So we know the appointment ID. How do we know which one is selected? We need to understand which has been selected. We know that every shape becomes Cal appointment and we know the appointment ID. Why? Because we took that appointment ID inside this when we selected it, which was here, and we put that appointment ID directly into B9. So we know which one's been selected. We know which shape has. So if we know which shape has been selected, we can then check for that. So when we put that back into the variable here, appointment ID, putting it back into that variable, and then we're going to check for that shape. We're going to focus on that shape. I want to know is its current left position different than what we put into B15, or is its current top position different than what we put into B16? If either one of those conditions are true, meaning they're, they're not the same, we know the user has moved the shape. And then all we need to do is check for an accurate move, right? Or an inaccurate move. What would an inaccurate move be? An inaccurate move would be maybe somewhere up here, right? That's an inaccurate move, right? There's nothing we can do that's off the calendar. So when you're using drag and drop, you're going to have some parameters. Generally, they can't go further to the left, up the top, or below, or to the right, right? So what you need to do is you need to set your range in which the user can move it to. So we're going to do that right now. And then there's a message box. If they move, please make sure to move the schedule appointment to a correct schedule date on the schedule. We're going to click OK. It's going to refresh that schedule, and no changes are going to be made. So the first thing we need to do is set our boundaries when we drag and drop so that if the user moves it, out of those boundaries. So our boundaries are what? A row four. We know top position can be less than row four. We know that the left position can't be less than column D. We know that the right position can't be, or let's say if, it, if the right position is more than the left position of column K, they've moved it too far to the right. And we know that the bottom can't be lower than, let's say, row 40, right? So we have our range of where the user can drag. So we want to make sure that it's within that range. And that's what we're going to check. So the second thing you want to do is determine if the user has moved their shape out of the range, we need to let the user know. So we can do that. There's going to be four conditions we're going to check on. The left position, the right position, the top position, and the bottom position. We're going to check all those. So we can do that. If the left position of that shape does not equal B15 or the top position does not equal B16, then we know the user has moved it. So once we know they've moved it, we can then check for an incorrect move. If the left position is less than D1, that means column D is moved beyond column D, like column A, B, or C. We know that it's moved too far to the left. If the left position is greater than column K, right, greater than column K, we know they've moved it too far to the right. Okay, so that's two conditions. Now we're going to check on the top position. If the top position is greater than A39, they've moved it too far down, below. Or if the top position is less than A4, meaning row 4, we're focused on 4. The A is not important, only the row 4. That means if the top position is less than row 4, they've moved it too high up. 
So we need to let the user know that message box that you just saw, letting them know that they've moved it. We are going to refresh the schedule and we're going to exit the sub. So next up, we could probably set um, probably set B1 to true as well to get them out, but that should be exiting the sub. We could do N2 that will also end and an exit okay so that's probably a good idea it's going to get out of that loop okay we know they've moved it and they moved it into a correct area so what we want to do is we want to get that data what column did they move it to what road did they move it to did they move it to a different employee a different date wherever your data is located we need to determine what row or what column and what data needs to change so for our purposes in this schedule our destination row, the row that it ended up, what is the row where it landed, right? If they're moving it from one area, where did it end up? Where's its destination? The destination, I wanna extract that. So we're gonna take that shape and it's gonna be the top left cell row. That is the row that it ended up. That's called, we'll call that the row destination. And once we know that destination, it's going to help us determine what data should change. We also want to know the destination column. So we have the column destination. That is its present column. So let's spell that right. And so once we have that column destination, we're going to use the top left cell columns. Then what I want to do is I want to determine the date row. Now this gets a little bit tricky. So we see that we have about six rows, including the date. And that means I need to extract the date, whether they move it to this row, this row, this row, this row. And so it's going to be dependent on that. So I need to extract the date. The date is located in here. So we can use a little formula to do that. So the destination row, I want that destination, even though we just had it, the destination row, I need to make sure it lands on the date, whether it's row four, row 10, row 16 here, or row 22 or whatever, I need to make sure that's the row because that's the row where our data is located. And that's very important. So the destination row is gonna be the current row minus the destination row plus two mod six. So this little formula is gonna easily return four, 10, a 16 and so on and so forth based on that. So it's gonna take whatever row. That formula is gonna help us determine the actual row. So now the date row is one of those six rows, four, 10, 16, whatever, okay? So we're gonna use mod six because there are six rows where we're dividing it by six and we're determining it with this, the destination row. A little bit complicated, but all you need to know that is important is we need to understand the destination row it has to be that date. What is the appointment date? Now we're gonna take that new appointment date, it's gonna be that destination column and the destination row, whatever the value is, is our date. And that new date is very important because it is that new date that must go into the database. It must go inside column D right here, that new date once I've extracted it. So let's take a look at that. That new date is gonna be the date of destination row and the destination column, that's our scheduled date. If the appointment date is nothing for any reason, we can exit out of the sub. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna update that. Another way to do that, we know the database row, but I could also do this. So if we know it's selected, I can just change it to M6 right here, change the date, and then click save. That's another way. Or I, could, I know the database row, that database row is located right inside B10. I could take that database row and I could update it and I could refresh it, but either one is gonna go just fine. What I would like to do even better is I want to extract it. If I know this is on the third and I move it to the fourth, I want this fourth to be reflected. So all we really need to do is change this and then run the macro to save. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. M6 is gonna take on that appointment date. Appointment save changes, we're saving those changes, which is gonna actually save that new date into the database. Then all we need to do is just resort it. We wanna make sure it's resorted accordingly. And so we are going to then run the macro that's going to refresh the schedule. So once we save it, inside this macro is a schedule refresh. If we look inside here, appointment, and we look in the save, we see that this schedule is gonna automatically refresh because we're running this save, it's gonna automatically refresh right here. So we don't need to add that refresh inside here. Again, we're setting the move to true. That's gonna exit out of the loop. We don't need to be in that loop and we're gonna end it out. And then just in case it runs the loop without any changes, I, so we, let's say it's finished with the delay, user never made changes, we're gonna set true to B1. So that's all we need to do is set B1 to true. Okay, very good. So that's a very, very cool way. So inside the shapes, we show you how to drawing and positioning, holding the data, and now modifying data through drag and drop. Very powerful. Last is sorting data. Sorting data is super powerful in this training, especially 
we're going to use resorting uh, multiple data points. In this training, we actually had to do it twice, right? Because inside the schedule, if we notice, did you notice here that not only are they sorted by date, but they're sorted by time. So if I were to change this time to 9 a.m., I want it to appear first. So not only do we need to sort by date, but we need to sort by time. So if I make this change here and I change it to 9 a.m. instead of 11 a.m. and then I save that appointment, I need to make sure that Fred Constanza gets early, gets, gets done the first before the Fred Fredders. So we're going to use data sorting for just that. And I also want to sort it by date. So to do that, sorting is a powerful tool. Okay, so we're going to use sorting for one, sorting to arrange our data properly, and also it's great to remove blank rows. So inside our macro, I kind of skipped over it because we're now getting into it. So inside our schedule refresh, we did just that. So there's the schedule macros. And inside our schedule refresh, up here we also sorted the data, which was very popular. Once we ran that advanced filter and we had those results come in here, we wanted it sorted. In fact, I wanted it sorted by date and by time. So that way, when I build out and duplicate those shapes, the order is also based on time. So we can do that using the sort feature. When you're using sort, we're going to do it right here. We all want to make sure a few things. We want to make sure that we actually have data. So we're going to do if the last results row is less than three, that means we have no data, nothing to sort. However, if we have just one row of data, there's nothing to sort also, right? So we need to check if there's one row of data. Anytime you're doing sort, if there's just one row of data, we're not going to sort. Okay, so what we want to do then is assuming that we have more than one row of data, we then want to sort it. So the first thing we want to do is focus on that sheet. We're on the sheet appointments database already. So with sort on that, we're going to clear any existing sorts. Very important. Then what we want to do in this case, I want to sort it by two different fields. The first one is the larger one and then the smaller one. So the first thing we're going to do is sort it by date. We need to add that key. And that key is going to be on the first data, which is 03, the first row of data 03, sorting by date. Second one's going to be on P. So inside that first one, we're going to sort fields and we're going to add a key. And that key, I need to call out that sheet again. Very, very important. Why do I need to call out the same sheet again, even though I've already called it out here? Because here we're in a brand new width. This is with sort. So I need to recall that same sheet again based on 03. I want to sort in the values and ascending, very important, the earliest to the latest. And I want to sort normal. That's the first sort. The second sort is going to be based on time. And again, we're going to add another key. This time it's going to be based on P3. That's our first time on P3. And we're going to sort it ascending also the earliest dates first and based on time. We're going to then set that range. That range is going to be the first row of data, which is M3, and the column in the last row. Q is the last column, and we already have the last row. Appointment, again, calling out the sheet one more time, range M3 through Q in the last results row. That's going to set the range. Lastly, all we need to do is apply that sort. So sorting a super powerful feature that's going to allow us to display the data in any order we want. So I really like the ability to sort. Sometimes uh, we want to use sort to remove blanks. Very powerful. If I were to delete a contact, right? Let's say I've deleted this contact, but I wanted to keep the contact ID. So I've deleted that contact. I want to make sure that when we save it, that that blank row doesn't end up here. So sorting is a great way to do that. So if I decide I'm going to save a contact, it's going to resort that list and that contact, I forget what his name, Fred Fredders. Oh, I can't, I can't remember Fred. Okay, Sandy Beach. Sorry, Sandy, you got to go. Sandy Beach is going to be gone when we resort and we don't want any blank rows. And that's another advantage to having contact names. So that's why we use a separate list. And when we sort, it's going to remove those blank. So when we go back into the schedule here and we let's say we're going to edit Frank and we save him. It's going to automatically run the macro and we're going to take a look inside the context. And we see that Sandy Beach is no longer here. We have a uh, data. And if we take a look inside the schedule and we select on the drop down list, Sandy Beach is not here and it's perfect and there's no blank rows, which is exactly what I want. So how do we do that? Well, again, that's with a sort, but it's very, very simple sort. And that's going to be on contact macros and on contact save. Remember, we save your update and then we sorted the name. So contact sorting names, we did go over the advanced filter part of it. And also we want to then run the sort part of it. So first thing was advanced filter, and that's going to get all the names, except they're not going to be sorted here. Then what I want to sort them alphabetically so that they're nice and they're easier to find inside our scheduling because they're all sorted 
alphabetically so I can quickly find it. Or of course, I can also type, start typing them in. And in the newer versions of Excel, I really like autocomplete automatically works. I was surprised to found that a few months ago. And that means no more linking. If you're using the new version of Excel, just start typing them in. And it's, I really like that. Super cool. Okay, so um, that's a really great feature. So we want to run that sort. So running that sort, sorting by name will remove those blank rows. Very powerful. We're going to run it based on L3 inside the context. That's our key. So our first value, we want to make sure that we actually have more than one row. If our last result was less than four, we're going to exit. There's no sort on just one row of data, always something. So we're again, running the sort just like we did, L3, sorting on values, ascending, similar to what we did. And so running that just on a single column in this case, alphabetically. So one, it sorts them alphabetically, and two, it removes those blank rows. Very, very powerful feature, sorting. Wow, what a cool thing. And the best part about this bonus here, your bonus for sticking with us on all the way, this drag and drop appointment schedule is yours absolutely free. All you need to do is click download in the link in the description. I'll make sure to include it. This is an incredible appointment schedule. I made it just for you. I hope you appreciate this and the training. Of course, seeing my shiny bald head was something interesting. So let me know if you like that. It's, I guess I can connect with you better if I see you. Maybe you can connect with me, see me, so I won't be shy. I took a while to do my hair today, but it's okay. So appointment scheduler, absolutely yours free. It, we can do recurring items. You can even send to Alec. So many really cool features in this one. If you want to just add it, go ahead and download it. Click the link below. Of course, many great ways to support our channel. I've got 300 amazing templates all packed into a single zip file. Some of my best applications. That's a great way also to support it. I'll include all the links down below along with our courses and our products. Thank you so much. This has been an incredible training where you've learned the five fundamentals of application development in Excel, whether it's from advanced filters, fundamental formulas that will help you get those jobs and projects done much quicker, along with data mapping that will supercharge your user forms or your sheet forms, shape utilization, super powerful, super fast, and super handy, and of course, sorting the data. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next week.